Good morning, friends. Welcome to Glen Hope Baptist Church. My name is Louis Baber. I'm the pastor here. I uh, want to extend a special welcome to guests that are here this morning. In case I didn't get around to you, we are glad that you are here. Uh, if you are a guest, we certainly invite you to come out to our welcome center. Do I need to move this? Come to our Welcome Center after service today. It's right through the doors here. Uh, one of our members will certainly help you get down there and uh, got a gift that we'd love for you to have and take away from you, take away from here with you today. Friends, let's talk about some announcements. First and foremost, some of you have seen, many of you have seen per perhaps, but we are glad to welcome Paul Carey Brown into the world. Kevin and Brandy had their little baby boy. Yes. That was on Friday. Friday he was born. And so, um, and they're home now. Got home last night, late last night. So they are resting right now as we speak. Maybe, I don't know. But, uh, Excited to welcome that little boy into the world, and, and so many of you, there are several families that have helped them with farming the kids out. They, they extend their thanks to those families that have helped, their thanks to all of you for prayers and gifts and meals coming up, so thank you guys so much for, for loving them. Um, so let's talk about that name, because I think KB dropped a hint one time when he was preaching about being named after a missionary. So Paul, you might think, is Paul in the scriptures, but no, KB is heavily influenced by a modern-day missionary and preacher named Paul Washer, and so that's where the Paul comes from primarily. Brandy also had an uncle named Paul, so there's influence there. And then Cary, C-A-R-Y, comes from a missionary that I introduced you guys to back on July 4th when we were looking at our five or so important and influential American missionaries. And this missionary was Lot Carey. Lot Carey was uh, the first, one of the first African-American missionaries, and he went to Liberia, but he was born and lived in the same place that myself, Kevin, and Brandy come from. So Lot Carey, Carey comes from that. Paul Carey Brown. Probably more than you needed to know. Anyway, um, announcements, reminders for you. You got some women's and men's ministry events coming up, ministry events coming up, women's ministry at the end of September, September 25th. Uh, you can sign up in the Action Center or Sunday School class for that. Men's ministry event coming up October 9th over at Cedar Rock Park, and you will be able to sign up in RSVP for that. Next Sunday, Celebration Sunday, of course, a little bit different as far as the fellowship meal goes, but you can order a boxed meal from Mike's Deli. We'll have those delivered here. Uh, so you could sign up any number of ways, Action Center, email to Sherry. Um, I think went around in your Sunday school classes this morning as well. Uh, we've got several men who are nominated to serve as deacons for you to consider. We will ask you to take the next couple of weeks praying over those names, praying for those men, praying for those families, praying for wisdom and discernment um, And when it comes to affirming these names. But Lynn Apple, Jerry Compton, Lee Darden are men who have accepted nominations and we'll have the chance on September 19th to affirm them or not as deacons for the next three years. And one final thing to let you know that uh, Senior Adult Bible Study will not be meeting, will not be meeting on Tuesday. All right. RP, call to worship. That's you, right? Oh, I'm looking up there. You're right there. Good morning, church. In the past few weeks, we've been in a um, series on faith and what faith is, how do we grow in our faith. Uh, last week, we talked about faith and community. Um, and so this 
week, I want to read from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 through 25. Scripture says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up in love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is a habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. And this is a responsibility of us as Christian community. Each week we come in this building and we remind us of the story that we are caught up in. Uh, One pastor talks about worship as a way to restory ourselves, um, that we are caught up in a bigger story. um, And this is what our duty as Christian community is to do. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for a chance to come in from a week of being out in the world. Lord, we might come in today feeling tired from the week. Maybe some of us are burdened with sin, anxious, stressed. But Lord, we have a chance today to to enter in again to the the story of creation, the story of redemption through your son, and the ultimate story of restoration to come. God, I pray that we would continually remind each other what we are caught up in, that we don't live the week focusing on us or our needs, but we encourage one another stir up one another in love and that we live missionally where we're at. God, help us to live into the bigger purpose than just living for ourselves. Lord, we thank you for the story we're caught up in. And ask that we would live more into that. Remind each other daily every week as your return is getting near. Lord, we love you. Help us to love you more. Help us to serve where you have called us to serve. In your name I pray. Amen. Good morning, church. As we move into uh, worship this morning, um, as, we, as Ryan was talking about caught up in our story and um, as we think about the grace of, of God and how uh, he gives it to us even though we don't deserve it. Um, let's remember that this morning and remember that uh, he came and died in our place. So let's stand and worship. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? 
shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my down your life, that I would be set free, oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me, next song we're reminded of some of the different names of Jesus in the chorus that he is Messiah that he is the blessed Redeemer that he is Emmanuel so I want us to remember all the different ways that he speaks to us and the different things that he is to us he is our hope he is our future he is our Redeemer
are ready for action this morning. And speaking of that, that reminds me that next Sunday, they're going to stay in here with us as we celebrate baptism and the Lord's Supper in our service. And we want those little ones to see what's going on. So as I frequently remind you, we want them to know, see, and ask you questions, parents and grandparents, about what it is they've seen, what it is that's going on, so we can plant these seeds of the gospel with them while we have them in our homes and have them captive, so to speak. We want them to know and understand what's going on. Now, before I get to our prayer prompts this morning, I I did want to to mention, we're kind of, I mentioned last week Miss Jean Ross, and I neglected to mention one other person that was coming off the injured reserve list, and we got another person coming off injured, we're like a football team, we're getting all our players back, all right, so we see Miss Marceline Dean, Brother Rennie Farrell, both have come off the injured list and are back in action with us last week and this week, so welcome back, guys, from back surgery, from broken hip surgery and healing there. We're glad that you guys are are back with us today. Our prayer prompts for this week are, again, um, focusing in on our students, the student ministry that we have on Wednesdays in particular with our Awanas ministry, our Glen Hope Bible Club. We call it Glen Hope Bible Club because unchurched people got no clue what Awanas is. A lot of church people might not know what Awanas is, so maybe people can understand what a Bible club is. We know what we're talking about. So that ministry and then our our youth ministry, our middle and high school ministry, um, as we try to reach students on Wednesdays with these various ministries. And the goal um, that we want to be praying for, in particular as we think about uh, Awana ministry, the Bible club, is that kids are not just memorizing verses for the sake of memorizing verses, but they are, that they are hiding God's word in their hearts. And as they hide his word in their hearts, that they will be transformed and that their families even will be transformed as parents perhaps help them to do this or as parents are moved to help them do this. This is another thing that we can pray for, that we see uh, parents use this, grandparents, neighbors, whoever are bringing them to use this as a discipleship opportunity. When you think about our middle school and high school students, we want to pray that what's going on in their lives right now is they come to Bible study on Wednesdays and Sunday mornings, that this is not just a placeholder that they're doing because they're living in their parents' homes and they have no choice but to come or to be here, but praying that there is true transformation taking place in their hearts and that they will not walk away from the church, will not walk away from the faith as we see so many people do. We want to see them grow as disciples even now and continue growing as disciples and be true followers of Christ. We see uh, we're praying for Northside Fellowship this week. Uh, Their pastor is Kirk Ward. I've met Kirk. Uh, They are over here kind of behind putt-putt over here and really are attempting to do the same thing that we believe God has called us to, and that's to impact the the community that they are planted in over there at Northside. So we want to be praying for them. And Cloverdale Street this morning are praying that we develop meaningful relationships and can see the spread of the gospel on Cloverdale. Let's pray. Father God, we honor you and worship you this morning. As, as Ryan has pointed out, a, a gathered body of believers for the most part. Surely there are people in here who are not followers of Christ, who are just maybe trying to figure that out, figure that out learn who this Jesus is. We pray that they will be prompted today to become followers of Jesus. But for those of us who are God, we are grateful that we can know it is right, it is proper, it is our responsibility and our privilege to pray to you, to come.
come to you, Father, and acknowledge that you are the one who can do anything that he desires to do, to acknowledge that your will is right and perfect, and that perhaps even in prayer, what we are trying to do is to, to ascertain and understand your will. And in particular, God, we're praying to understand your will regarding children's ministry. God, we pray that it is indeed your desire that many children be saved and transformed through Bible club, through middle school and high school ministry, that their lives be transformed forevermore, that their homes be transformed, and that there be generational impact from, from here on out as a result of what happens in particular on Wednesdays as we pray for that, God. We pray that our, our teachers, our leaders, our volunteers in ministry will be encouraged and emboldened even on days when they've prepared for many and only one or two show up or days when they're hoping maybe only one or two show up because they're not very prepared and 15 or 20 show up. God, I pray that they will be encouraged in you to prepare faithfully for your honor and your glory. I pray that the, the children and students will be encouraged by your presence to, to be here, to be involved, to learn, and to grow on whatever level it is that they're starting with. Father, we pray for Northside Fellowship today. We pray for Kurt Ward over there. We pray, God, that they will faithfully preach and teach the Word of God so that people will be saved. Lives will be transformed. We pray for our, our neighbors on Cloverdale Street this morning, God, that they will know something of who you are from our prayer walking, from our reaching out, open doors for us to establish relationships, God, so that we can share the truth of the gospel with our neighbors on Cloverdale for your glory and for your honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, this morning we're finishing up. This is the last in our series of Understanding Faith. Uh, we've been in this for nine weeks now. Various passages of Scripture, trying to understand what faith is, um, understanding some of the characteristics of do, do we grow in faith? Do we sometimes not use all that we have? Are some people just have this little bit and some people have this much and that's what they're destined to. Uh, we've answered some of those questions and in the, in the next week or so, I'm going to send out a summary to you of some of the, the big ideas that we have learned and that you can take away from this Understanding Faith series. But, uh, you know, we, we have gotten to the point today where we will uh, take a look in Romans uh, chapter 10 verses 1 through 17, and see some characteristics of faith and how to get it, how do you get faith, so to speak, and how do you grow in your capacity to exercise it. Because we have made the, I have made the, the statement at the very beginning, in the first week uh, of this, that I believed then and I'll tell you, I still believe now, after going through this for nine weeks, that faith is indeed a, a gift of the Holy Spirit given to believers. And we have the full capacity, every one of us has a full capacity of faith available to us from the beginning of our journey with the Lord. The question is, do we always exercise the full capacity of that faith? And generally speaking, we don't. We don't always do that. The people that we've studied in the scriptures didn't always do that. We have high moments where, where we are exercising the full capacity of it and low moments where it seems as if it doesn't even exist in us. And so we'll, we'll see something today of how we get it and how we grow in, the exercise, in, in exercising of that faith more consistently. So Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 17. The scripture says, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. 
For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject, subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful for your word believing that faith comes from the hearing of it, the teaching of it, the living of it. I pray that in our time today, we all understand that and apply it and see our faith either become new or see our faith Become something that we learn to exercise and apply in every way, in every step of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, some things that we're going to see working through this scripture. There are, we could, in this one chapter, we could probably spend six, seven weeks. I say that frequently, but it's true. So today, I'm give, we're just going to take a high view. I'm not going to make every point that we could make uh, in, in our study of these verses today, but a few points that I think are important for what we're talking about today. The first thing we, we get to when we're looking at the first seven or so verses here is that Paul makes the point that faith in Jesus is better than self-righteousness. So you might say it this way, faith in Jesus is better than faith in yourself. Faith in Jesus is a better faith than having faith in myself, in my works. You see here that Paul is expressing his desire for their salvation. Who, who is he talking about? In particular, he's talking about his Jewish brethren, his Jewish brothers and sisters. Now, throughout Romans, he's speaking to Gentiles, and he's speaking to Jews, and he's speaking of the offer of salvation for all. We see that a little bit later, even in this chapter. But here in particular, in verse 1, he's speaking of his heart's desire that Jews be saved. And really, it comes down to, to the fact that they're so close. He, he, he's pointing out that, that they're so close to being saved that they have all the tools in front of them, all the tools before them that they could use properly and understand properly in order to be saved. But, but they're not seeing it. They're not getting it. They're not applying it. And it comes down to you know, some of those scenarios where either th there might be some people who just 
aren't seeing it. They don't see it. They just miss it. There might be others who see it, but they're not applying it. They're, they're choosing to, to go at it their own way. And so he, he's making the point here that, you know, the, the, the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures in particular, teach them about the righteousness of God. The, these Jewish people who, who, by and large, have been, that, that Paul is talking to anyway, have been very devout in their study of the Scriptures. Their devoutness has led them to understand that the Old Testament Scriptures speak to the righteousness of God and that the righteousness of God is something that they should understand to be unattainable because they have fallen short of His glory. They have fallen short of His righteousness. This is something that we talk about frequently. They understand that Isaiah has told them that all of our good deeds are but filthy rags before God. They, they understand this because they are students of the Old Testament Scriptures. And so, understanding these things of the righteousness of God. And I, I want to point out a couple more before I move on. The Psalms are full of works, words, and ideas about the righteousness of God. Point one out in Psalm 71, starting in verse 15. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and of your salvation all day long, for I do not know the sum of them. I will come with mighty deeds of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, yours alone. O oh God, you have taught me from my, from my youth, and I still declare your wondrous deeds. And even when I am old and gray, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to all who are to come. For your righteousness, O God, reaches to the heavens. You have done great things, O God, who is like you. And all throughout the Psalms, you'll see mention of the righteousness of God. You'll see Daniel talking about the righteousness of God. Over in Jeremiah, we see something of the righteousness, righteousness of God. And this is something that when we read here, I want you to hold on to for just a second. But Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6, says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. So this is prophecy from Jeremiah. When I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will, del will dwell securely, and this is his name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. And so all throughout the scriptures, we see that God is known and understood to be righteous. Anyone reading these scriptures properly will understand that, and they will understand that their own righteousness does not measure up. They will also understand, as Jeremiah is talking about here, that there is a branch a seed. There is one to come, a Messiah who carries on, lives out, is the righteousness of God. And so the perfect fulfillment, the perfect living out, this is pointing to Jesus. And so Paul is making the point here that, guys, you, you have before you a zeal. He acknowledges their zeal for knowing about God but they lack knowledge. You have this zeal for knowledge, but you lack knowledge. You have this zeal for knowing about God, but you're missing or not applying the very thing that you need to know, that you need to submit to about God. And that is that His righteousness is not attainable by you. You can't attain it. In fact, his point would be that that's the point of the law. The end of the law, Jesus is the, is the end of the law. We, we studied about that in Galatians as well. But, but we're seeing here that he's saying to them, the point of the law is to open your eyes to the fact that you can't match God's righteousness. And because of that, you are doomed. 
and you need help. You need a savior. You need one who is righteousness. You need who is righteous. You need the righteousness of God. But they miss it. They miss it. And they are trying. They are at work still trying to build their own righteousness, a, a righteousness that is their own by keeping the law, something that they can't do. They're missing that they have to keep all of the law. They would need to keep all of the law to be considered righteous by God in their own power. And not one of them has ever done it, not one of you, not one of me. None of us have ever done it. We can't, but they miss that, and they still keep trying to build their own righteousness. But still, they understand that God's righteousness is there. As I've thought about that this week, it's, it's occurred to me that it's, it's, it's kind of like they are in this place of maybe, maybe imagine being in the ocean. You're in the middle of the ocean, 100 miles out. No, no islands around anywhere, and your boat has sunk but you know how to tread water. And you're, you're treading water to save yourself, to, to preserve your life. And the whole time, here beside you is a life preserver, a life jacket, a raft, whatever it may be, but something that is floating and will preserve your life. But instead of getting on that or putting it on, you're sitting there still treading water because you think this is the way I will save myself. I will save myself by treading water and treading water and treading water until something happens until I get saved, until someone comes along, until I float to an island that may be nearby somewhere. That, that, and, and you're 100 miles out in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of nowhere, middle of the South Pacific. There's not, there's not an island coming up. There's not a boat coming up. It's, it's fruitless for you to be doing this. But you got something right here that you should cling to, that you can cling to, that's better, that will get the job done. And so, and you know it's there. You know it's there. But you don't cling to it. You cling to your own efforts to be the thing that will save you. And you think, you know, all of you, I think, get my point, you, you think that's just ridiculous to be in that type of scenario. But friends, I want you to understand that's the scenario that so many people find themselves in. Clearly, that's the scenario that Paul is pointing out that the Jews found themselves in, in particular, that he was talking to in that moment. But that's the scenario that maybe people in this building right now actually find yourself in, if you are honest that you're not so much counting on the righteousness of Jesus Christ to have saved you or to save you, but you've been counting on your good works. You've been counting on thinking that I'm better than this person or I'm better than that person. I'm not the worst person in the world, so I, surely I'll be saved. You're counting on I, I serve this way or I serve that way. I volunteer with this organization, I volunteer with, for, for this ministry at church. And you're counting on your, your own efforts. But all the while, it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that God wants to impute to you that, you, that will actually save you. And it's right there beside you. And you know it because you've learned about it. You've been to Sunday school. You've heard me talk about it 50 million times. It's right there. But that's not what you're embracing. You're still embracing your own efforts. And that is futile. 
because there's a better faith. You think about it. I mean, what it comes down to is that there are many people that, practically speaking, have before them the, the choice of placing my faith in Jesus or placing my faith in my own efforts. And what they're doing is placing their faith in their own efforts. Now, most people haven't thought of it that way. Because, but if you think of it that way, oh my gosh, who would ever do that? Who, who would, it, especially people who have, who have been around church and come to church most of their lives. You know, you know enough to, to I would think, when presented that way, to say, oh gosh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to put my faith in myself. That's what self-righteousness is. It's self-faith. And there's a better faith I submit to you. And the better faith that I submit to you that Paul is teaching us about is faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus Christ. Now, what of that? What, does, what exactly does that mean then? To have faith in Jesus. We see in verses 8 through 10 that faith comes through confessing and believing Jesus. This faith comes through confessing and believing Jesus. So he's answering that question of who you're going to trust, yourself or Jesus. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. It's right there. You've been around it. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And so this faith, this saving faith, comes through confessing and believing Jesus. And so we got to talk for a moment Spend our, our moments here talking about what, what exactly is meant by confessing and believing. Confessing Jesus and believing Jesus. Confession. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. I think we probably all have an understanding of what it means to confess. Right? When we think about it uh, in our everyday lives in, in, in our court system, when I confess something, I say, I did it. I did it. Maybe you have to confess something, not just in court, but you have to confess at home to your spouse. You have to confess to your parents. I did it. I ate the cookie. I ate the last donuts. You know, you got to confess these things sometimes. Maybe I more than others. But we understand that, right? We understand this, this idea of that part of confession. I did it. And that can apply here. I, I think it's not wrong to understand that confessing Jesus as Lord, can, we can rightly apply it. I did it, right? I did it. I do it. I confess Jesus as Lord. We also understand that confession... In a, in a biblical way, in a theological way, has to do with a statement of belief, a, a confession. You can look back through church antiquity. You can see uh, different confessions of faith where it's a statement of what we believe. It's a statement of what a certain group of people says they believe about who Jesus is, about his work about the person and work of Jesus. And that is the fullness of what we're getting, about, getting to here when we're talking about confessing Jesus. It's talking about, this is what I believe about the person and work of Jesus. And what we're getting at here is a biblical belief, a biblical understanding of the person and work of Jesus. All that he claims to be and all that he has done from birth to perfect life, to death, to resurrection, to saying, I and the Father are one, 
to saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. All these claims of Jesus, I confess that I believe. This is foundational, my foundational confession of Jesus. But then in particular, Paul also says here, confess Jesus as Lord. Confess Jesus as Lord. Now remember, with the particular audiences that Paul is writing to in this moment, to a Jew and Gentile word, world, this confession of Jesus as Lord is going to have particular meaning. So to the Jew, confessing Jesus as Lord, saying, yes, Jesus is Lord, it's going to carry with it the understanding because Lord is that word used for God in the Old Testament. And so a Jewish person confessing Jesus as Lord is going to, be see, going to be saying that this Jesus Christ, this Jesus of Nazareth, I believe that he is God. I do believe that he is the same person as God. And so that's a big confession for a Jewish person in that day or any day. Now, that confession matters to the Gentile as well. It matters to you and me that Jesus is God. When I say Jesus is Lord, that equals Jesus being God. So that's big. That's a big confession. On the flip side, the Gentile, when the Gentile says that Jesus is Lord, what they are meaning in particular in this day, in this context that Paul is writing in, that Jesus is my Lord, Jesus is my master, not the emperor. Not Caesar. Not whoever is leading the Roman Empire or, the, or whatever government I sit under. But in particular, as you think about the Roman Empire, the Gentile, the Roman citizen who says, who confesses Jesus as Lord, is saying, no, it's not you, emperor. It's not you, Caesar. It's Jesus who is my Lord. And that's big, because the, the, the Roman emperor was seen as, the, the, as one of the gods, but the ultimate god. He was to receive worship in most cases. And so this confession of Jesus as Lord carries significant weight to the people that Paul is writing to. It carries significant weight to you and I when we confess Jesus as Lord. Because we confess the same things. We confess that Jesus is God. He and the Father are one. We confess that Jesus is my Lord. He is my master. He is my ma He is the master of my life. When, when one is the master of someone's life. That means I'm listening. I'm doing everything they say. I, got, I have no, no other choice in reality. We do, but I'm living as such that I don't because this is my master. I do what he says. I'll be obedient out of love to him and for him and receiving love from him. This is my master. That brings up an issue that I think you've probably heard. Maybe you've dealt with it yourself. Maybe you're dealing with it yourself right now. But I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people through the years who have told me, and maybe not in so many words, but they're also living it, but people who have said, you know, Jesus is my Savior. I'm struggling right now, and I've struggled, maybe I've struggled all my life, with him being my Lord, but he is my Savior. People, even people who don't say it in those particular words, live that. And, I, and my assertion, my assertion is that many of you know people who live this. Maybe they don't actually say it, but they live this. They live with the idea that Jesus is their Savior, that eternal life is theirs, but Jesus is not their Lord because they don't gather with the saints. They don't study the Word of God. They don't grow in the fullness, into the fullness of the capacity of their faith. They don't do anything to cultivate their relationship with Jesus. 
I've recently talked with a man who told me as much, who told me that he was saved as a teenager. He's well into his 60s now. And it hasn't been to church in over 50 years. Hasn't read the Bible in over 50 years. But says, Jesus is my Savior. Friends, if, if that's you, if you're thinking that, if you know someone who's thinking that, that Jesus is my Savior, but he's not my Lord, these are not saved people. What does it say here? Confess Jesus as Lord and you'll be saved. Confess Jesus as Lord. And so if you have this idea that you can live in this duality, that Jesus is my Savior but not my Lord and be okay, I think the Scripture tells us something different. The Scripture says confess Believe. Remember, that my confession is my statement of belief. It's my foundation of belief. It's what I live on. Jesus is Lord. If Jesus is not the Lord of your life, I don't think that he's the Savior of your life. He can be as soon as you make him Lord. As soon as you make him Lord. And it says, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Believe in your heart. This is more than emotional connection. When, when, when the scriptures, in particular the New Testament, the Old Testament as well, but whenever we're talking about the heart and believing something from the heart, uh, thinking from the heart, the, 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 in, the, in this day and age that, we're, that we see where the Bible is written, the idea is that the heart is the center of thinking, that, that the heart is where thinking and emotions come from. And so this is the, the center, this is the the, the the, the, the foundational point of, of everything that happens as we would think in our minds. But it's the heart where it comes from. But you know, I mean, you, you can relate to that because when you believe something from your heart, you're talking about believing it from, your, from the depths of your being. And it's not just an emotional thing. It is an intellectual thing and an emotional thing and a depth of belief thing. And all this, I think, is necessary for confessing Jesus, for believing Jesus, and for being a saved person, for having faith. This is what we are talking about here. As we move on, verses 11 through 13 show us that faith is abundantly available. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so we understand, we, we, we've seen this as we studied in Galatians the other week, but whoever means whoever. And so there is, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. That this, this, this offer of salvation, this offer of Faith in Jesus resulting in righteousness is available to whoever will believe it. Whoever we believe that Paul is also taught here in the bounds of who God is calling to believe that. But there are no cultural bounds. You don't have to be born Jewish. You don't have to have generational connections in the church. But it's available to whoever will believe. Whoever will respond to what the Lord is doing to the people that he's putting in front of you, to the scripture that he's had you read, to the prompting that he's made in your heart. Whoever will respond to that, whoever will call on the name of the Lord Jesus, whoever will confess him as Lord, believe everything about him, his resurrection, his, his life, his death, his resurrection, whoever will do these things will be saved. It, and it's abundant in that way. There's an interesting note here as well, though. When he says there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, there's a twofold purpose in that, I believe. The, the one is what we've already talked about, that there's no preference that, that only Jewish people can be saved in this context. 
there's no preference in our context that only people who have a connection to a local church throughout their generations can be saved. You, know, you can come up out of nowhere and be saved, right? So uh, there's that, that there's no distinction. Whoever it is can be saved. But then there's this, this idea when he says that there's no distinction, that there's, there's not a way for the Jewish person to be saved and then a way for the Gentile person to be saved. And, and you'll see that play out with some of, the, some of the letters you see, some of the epistles in the New Testament, some of the debate that goes on between the disciples, between Paul and Peter, and, 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 and people throughout the, the, the scriptures, this debate that, okay, this Gentile has to become Jewish before they can be, be, become Christian. You see that play out in that way, that there is, you know, a way for the Jewish and a way for the Gentile, and the Jewish thinking that the Gentile has to become Jewish. Maybe the Gentile thinks that, hey, I can go this way or that way. And so there's, there's no separate route depending on where you're coming from, is what Paul is alluding to here. There, there are not different ways. There's no distinction in the way a man or woman will be saved. There is one way. And this way is abundant. This way in Jesus is abundant. It is enough. The way of Jesus is enough to save all who will be saved. The way of Jesus is enough. His sacrifice, his life, his death, his resurrection is enough to save you, no matter who you are, no matter where, where you're coming from. You don't need to add to it. You certainly don't want to detract, take away from it. You don't want to do something different than that. There is one way, and that way is abundant, and that way is sufficient, and that way is enough. How do you get it? Faith comes by hearing the word of Christ. How, will, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Most of the people I'm talking to here today are in this category of knowing the truth. You've heard the truth. You've responded to the truth in obedience to follow Jesus Christ as a disciple of Jesus Christ, faith in Jesus Christ as the one thing and the one thing alone that restores you to right relationship with the Father. You believe that. You live it. You live with Jesus as Lord of your life. You can admit that there, there are days when you are exercising the full capacity of your faith, and there are days where it might not look like you got any faith at all. We get that. We understand that. But our goal, our call, our responsibility even, is to, is to limit those days, limit the, limit the days where we are not exercising the full capacity of faith, but to live in the fullness of that faith each and every day, to grow in our ability to do that. And that this has some application to us. When, when the scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. We understand two application points here. That the, the lost person, the person who does not have faith in Jesus, the person who has not heard that there is this one way to be restored to right relationship with God. This is the problem that every person has. We've got a broken relationship with God. And the only way to, to see that relationship restored is through faith in Jesus. And Paul says here that the only way that people will do that is through the Word of God. It's the Word of Christ. It's through people hearing that. People hearing the truth of the Scriptures. And so that's what we have to put in front of people. That's what you have to continue to, to put in front of your co-worker 
your sister, your brother, your nephew, your cousin, your spouse, your friend, whoever it may be that you know you're one that you're praying for. We got to pray that the Word of God gets into their hearts and minds, gets into their, their spectrum. This is where faith comes from. Not through cleverly designed arguments on our behalf. You know, many times we, we don't share the gospel with people because we think, oh, this person I'm about to talk to, this person that I think I should be talking to is so much smarter than me. They've read so much more than me. I will, I will surely lose a debate. I will, surely, I will surely just be wiped away by this person when we start talking about things of faith. Well, Paul's not asking us to win a debate here. Paul's not saying that faith comes through you having a cleverly designed argument. He doesn't say that faith comes through you reading more books than this person does. No, faith comes from hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. So keep quoting that scripture around people or start quoting that scripture around people. Pray that scripture for these people. Pray scripture over them. And whenever you get the opportunity, make the word of God alive in their lives. Make the word of God present in their lives. That's, that's how it will happen. And that's why we will continue as long as I have breath and am called to be a preacher of the Word, we're going to preach the Word of God. We will preach verse by verse through books of the Bible until, until I die. Because this is where faith comes from. It comes from the Word of God. And so when you bring your unchurched friends, neighbors, co-workers, to Glen Hope Baptist, they're going to hear the Word of God because that's where faith comes from. So be comfortable in bringing them here because they won't be offended by anything I say. They'll be, if they're offended, they'll be offended by the Word. And in fact, Jesus talks about that. In Luke chapter 10, verse 16, he says, the one who listens to you listens to me. The one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. So any rejection is, is, is in any offense, is, is rejection of God and offense by God's Word. That's what it comes down to. So we're going to keep doing that. We're going to keep preaching the Word. And hopefully, more people will receive it rather than reject it. That's what we pray for. But also in this sea that I believe this is where we grow in our capacity to exercise faith. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Now, Understanding that you already have that. As a saved person, you have that faith. You have access to that full capacity of faith. But I believe that we can make a correct application here that our ability to exercise the fullness of that capacity comes as we continue to sit under the preaching of the Word. As we continue to grow and study the Word of God, then our capacity to exercise the fullness of faith on a 100% consist, consistent basis, grows. Grows. It's not that our faith grows. When you get saved, you have that faith. You have the, the ability, you have the access to that faith. But as you continue to study, as you continue to be in the Word of God, as you can continue to hear the Word of God, your capacity to exercise that faith will grow. And so faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. What, I ask, are you confessing? What are you confessing? My prayer for you, my hope for all of us here listening, 
viewing this later on, is that our confession is that Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is the Lord of my life. And all that that means. I challenge you today. Challenge you today, friends. If your confession is something other than Jesus is Lord, repent today. Repent. Change that. Recognize that if, you are, if you're in that boat that says, Jesus is my Savior, but eh, not so much my Lord, you are not saved. But you can be. You can be by confessing and living that Jesus is the Lord of your life. What are you confessing? Let's pray. Father, we're grateful that today we can understand that you have made a way for us to know you forever, to live at peace with you forever. And it has nothing to do with our own efforts. And everything to do with your grace, your mercy, your gracious and merciful gift of a perfect sacrifice in Jesus. Your gracious and merciful gift then of his righteousness imputed to us, given to those who confess Jesus as Lord, believe that you raised him from the dead, believe everything that he claims about himself, that we believe it to be true, we believe it to be right, we believe it to be the thing that we need more than our own efforts. God, convict us God, will you convict us of of our own self-righteousness, of our own self-faith? So that we can know true faith in Jesus? And so that we can, those of us who are indeed believers, can grow in our exercising of that faith, our living out of that faith each and every day? God, I pray that, I pray, God, that it can be for all of us that we've seen the last day that we've not exercised the fullness of our faith. And that we can step into a transformed time for the rest of our lives on this earth that we are living in the fullness of faith in every way, every step that we take. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.